Welcome back everyone. Today's video was one that I didn't actually originally intend to do. I wasn't going to do an update on Global Atomic because I had spoken about it a number of times in the past and written about it once, but it was requested a few times and I figured that since I have been on the record saying that I like it and reasons I like it, I figured in this particular case I'd allow myself to be bullied into talking a little bit more about an update on Global Atomic and where it stands today in a few ways where I can add maybe a few things. Now again, I will say this, when I own shares, I will tell you I own shares, and in this case, I own them, it's a substantial position for me, but that doesn't make this investment advice. And as I mentioned before, although I'm allowing myself to be pushed into speaking about Global Atomic, I don't really want to cover recover every single uranium thing, uh, just a few. Now, since the last time I spoke about Global Atomic, a new PEA came out. Now, they say this PEA was done to PFS level of certainty, but either way, they're still going to need a definitive feasibility study, and they're still going to need to get the mining permits and do a little bit more work. Now, what did this PEA say? Well, it looked pretty good, um, and I'll show a bit a few comparisons in a minute, but the economics looked pretty good, and but it basically was what they said they were going to do. If you've been following the story for a while, you probably know um, they said they're going to try and have the costs under twenty bucks. They had almost standing costs of eighteen something. Can't remember exactly. They got the capex way down to a very manageable, very manageable in my opinion, two hundred and three million. And if you look at what the, the actions they've done, they've been hiring uh, mining experts. So they look like they want to take this into production, which is, again, what they said they were going to do. So, I mean, it sounds simple doing what you say you're going to do, but in practice, um, not all teams have done it. Now, on the timeline here, obviously, there's all sorts of all sorts of optimistic timelines throughout the sector. Um, everywhere, really, optimistic timelines. But um, so, yeah, they may be a bit optimistic there, but, you know, they're moving forward and they're doing the actions that need to be done in order to, if you wanted to build a mine, what would you have to do? Well, that's what they're doing. And, I mean, the cost structure looks pretty decent. Now, here figured since I've talked about reasons why I like it in another video, I figured I would go a bit into the numbers and how it kind of compares. Now, I'll link all the other stuff I've said about Global Atomic in the description of this video. If you're interested, there's a few things. I'll link them there if I remember. But here, this is just numbers and a bit of approximations on um, if you go into the higher prices, they're more estimates. Um, of what the net present value at an 8% discount would be. And so the first line you could see, well, you should see the different uranium prices, and then you could see the net present value, and that's in million US dollars, and at an 8% discount. And the next line is what that means for the share, what the share price of GLATF, which is the US ticker for Global Atomic, would mean to represent that net present value. So, I mean, this, this is just numbers. And the next thing I decided to add is just a bit of context. Now, I there's a number of companies in the peer group that I, that I really like, and many of them that have their own benefits and other um, added bonuses, locations, a whole bunch of different things. I just wanted to look at what the minimum that they could get financed at, like what what price of uranium would they need to get a decent return, and compare that apples to apples, if possible, not, it's not always possible, to after tax net present value, 8% discount to Global Atomic. And you can kind of see here, Boss, they can, they can make it work at 45. Um, they'd be worth uh, 77 million. Now, they have a long life asset, so there's all, all sorts of bonuses there. And, you know, there's scale and other things to consider. And 
similarly, fission. Fissions, I put a little asterisk there because they, for whatever reason, first they have it in Canadian dollars, so that's why you're looking at a number that you probably haven't seen before. I translated everything to US dollars, but they discount at 10%, so it's a bit different there. Now, there's some, maybe some, uh, well, with all of these, there's different timing issues that may need to be considered. But at 50 bucks, they're worth, well, what's it, 526 and a half million US dollars. You look at Vimy, it's another company based in Australia. So, you know, you could value different jurisdictions differently if you like. But again, that's the after tax. And again, uh, for Vimy, I used, had to use tax estimates because they don't, really give the after-tax numbers uh, up, just posted. So I used past uh, estimates and estimated what the tax implications would be for, to the net present value, converted to US dollars. These are all estimates. But I'm just trying to show how it compares at different prices econo with the economics versus other projects. And Bannerman's there at 65, that's a new Tango 8 and GoVX, that is just the Mad Maduella uh, project. So this is just a little comparison. Now, the other thing Global Atomic has that most other, well, no other uranium company has specifically this, but Global Atomic also has zinc. Now, I don't know what you think the long-term price for zinc is. Um, I know what I kind of think it is. I kind of think it's in the around 115 long term now that could go higher if the zip, based on the number of factors could go lower we'll have to see but there's all sorts of approximations you could use a buck you could use whatever you want to use and this chart here just kind of shows i don't really know what a fair value for the zinc is i mean if you look at befeza which is the bigger cousin they get um what is it eight ten ten times ebitda uh evd ebitda so it really depends what you want to use, but I'm just showing here at the different zinc prices what the long-term uh, EBITDA would be if they can get this zinc operation running as it's supposed to. And I mean, they've had, um, they've done this in the past at the, with the old plant, so they know what they're doing. Now the new production facility isn't at 100% yet, but if they can get it to 100%, these are just the numbers of what that should mean. Now, this first line, as I said, zinc price, then um, EBITDA, long-term, average out over long-term, it should be that. Third line, cents, how many cents per share in US, US cents per share, that is, it would be worth. And you could kind of see, or it would make each year in EBITDA. Fourth line is a three times multiple, what that would mean for share price and the last line is a five times multiple and what that would mean for share price so i don't know what it's worth i don't know what it's worth to you but these are just how you could look at it now when i hear the word synergies i often optimistically roll my eyes because synergies i don't know it just strikes me as two letters one is beginning near the beginning of the alphabet the other's later in the alphabet but the point is in this case, again, I'm not gonna call it a synergy because it's not, it's just a, how this piece may fit in. So you look at the CapEx. The CapEx for the uranium deposit is 203 million US, including 30 million contingencies. And that's that's one thing that's 20% almost in contingencies. Um, and so, I mean, that's, it's a substantial chunk of change, which if is not needed, that goes straight to, the net present value. But again, include it. You need to include contingencies because things cost more, things take longer, things don't do well. Now that's 10 years almost of zinc cash flow. So I know what you're saying. Oh, you had me excited. The zinc could work to fund it, but in the 10, I don't want to wait 10 years. And of course you don't want to wait 10 years. No one wants to wait 10 years for the uranium for to avoid dilution because of the zinc asset. But here's the thing, you don't need all that money now because if you have the asset and it's, if it's cash flowing, well, you could borrow against the future cash flows. Now, you don't have to, you may not have to borrow 10 years worth uh, based on all on the zinc asset, 
but you could get some project level debt finance. You could get some zinc uh, cash flow against the at the company level. And realistically, if you wait for fifty dollar uranium, or if you get fifty or more dollar uranium, this project has decently fast payback. I mean, uh, fifty dollar uranium has something like one hundred and forty million per year in cash flow, and if you compare that to two hundred and three million for capex i mean you could pay back in like a year or a year and a bit if you throw in the zinc also it's very quick payback but therein lies my primary hope if you will for the company the hope that they don't uh do something to get less to get their uranium price lower than what they can get because I don't see a reason, I don't see a real reason to lock in or sell uranium. Um, don't have to lock in, use a whole bunch of different ways that you can finance contracts. But I don't really see, see a reason to sell uranium below $50 per pound. Now, Global Atomic can, but that, in my view, doesn't mean they should. I think that I don't, I don't see a reason to sell a pound of uranium less than 50 bucks honestly if i'm in charge i'd probably uh try for higher because well, this isn't the place for that video or that conversation i guess you could say but the hope or my hope with the uh, pricing here has to be that they can get a decent price for the pounds now, the other point I'd like to make with regards to the zinc operation is it provides them with resilience, a certain resilience that many other companies may not have. Now, I wrote a blog post, and I will link that in the description, about Global Atomic and why it's the anti-fragile uranium investment. Now, don't get all excited or all, uh, there, now there's a bunch of things I have to read. I don't really post that often on the blog. It's big time sink, but... Uh, and there's a lot of overlap with the stuff I talk about on the channel. But in this case, it was something on my mind and I was just, um, I don't know, I felt like writing, so I did. Um, and I'll link that in the description. But when it comes to the zinc operation, there's a few more things that I wanted to say. One is that steel production matters, especially in Turkey. Now, why is this? Well, one, on one hand, the more steel that gets produced, the more EAFD, well, assuming it comes from electric arc furnace, the more electric arc furnace dust uh, the can be provided, can be recycled, and that is the business. Recycling um, zinc electric arc furnace dust is business for um, the zinc operation. The other reason is that higher steel production, more steel production, is a higher demand for zinc, meaning higher zinc price. So that's why steel production actually matters a lot. Well, I mean, the zinc price is kind of, no, I'd say steel mat production volume matters a lot for Global Atomic in the zinc side, at least. The other thing, I've had some questions about this and the weak lira, weak Turkish lira, is a positive for Global Atomic. And you can go into all sorts of reasons, but it's basically um, their big input cost is energy. Energy markets regulated in Turkey, so they get decent prices there. Whereas the, co well, so they, basically they cost in lira. So as the currency devalues, it's positive for them. That being said, the instability in a strictest sense of the word is not necessarily positive. Now, has anything come of this instability that's been negative? No, but it's just something that you don't particularly want to see, but as of yet hasn't really caused any impact for them. So let's hope that it continues not to. So in conclusion, I still view Global Atomic as very cheap based on the combination of low cost assets they have. I mean, even just the uranium asset is very cheap, even compared to some other options. Now, of course, everything matters based on uh, price you're paying for them versus others. But my point being, 
I really still think that you're not really paying much for the uranium at all when you consider the zinc and the economics on both are pretty good. Now, the hope has to be, of course, that they will play the uranium right, get a high enough price and manage what they have well. Now, they are heavily insider owned, so I hope that the insiders can do what is best for themselves and for shareholders because you know they want to. And uh, that's basically what I have to add to my thoughts on Global Atomic. Well, that's all for today, everyone. Thank you for watching. As always, hope you enjoyed or found something interesting. And with that, I will catch you next time. And until then, have a great day.